motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> everybody welcome to yeah. one fucking hour uh i am evan husney joined of course to my left we got tom fitzgerald over there what's up hi everybody oh that's a good one and uh to <laughs> my right we got uh marcus herring what's going on marcus you back home back home this yeah back home got a cold again you know, I don't know. Ever since everything opened back up, I've been sick like ten times. So the germs Rocking. are going around. Not COVID. I'm probably, though. I'm probably sick too. You know, something's wrong. I, got, I came down with something yesterday. So I think Party I'm time. sick too. I think I'm sick too. So oh, just, nice one. <laughs> I think we're all the trifecta. Sick. Yeah. All right. So. Amazing. Sick. This You're is a good sick. movie to be sick to. It you know? is. Very it's very true. cough syrupy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a, an right, well, fever dream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lead the way. Robo tripping. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Uh, this is uh, episode 27. Uh, oh my which is god! Hard to believe, but we're at we're at 27. And uh, tonight is Frank Perry. Uh, I'm actually going to call it Frank and Eleanor Perry's uh, The Swimmer uh, from 1968. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, so that's what we're looking at tonight. Very excited for that. And uh, I guess without further ado, I'm going to start that clock. So. All right. Look at <laughs> clock that clock. Okay. Come on now. Okay. And everybody's and here just for. For what? Yeah. This is what. Just start it. This is what everybody's here for. Okay. It's the clock right. start. And then they all tune out. That's the, the <laughs> that's the <laughs> diagnostics. It's like they just want to watch that clock. The clock. Oh, there's clock problems. Okay. I got there it. we go. <laughs> no, I started it. All right. <clears throat> all right. Okay. Uh, the Swimmer, uh, David Schwimmer. Uh, the Swimmer is the 1968 <laughs> allegorical dream state drama from husband and wife team Frank and Eleanor Perry, of course, with Frank directing and scripting from Eleanor. It's based on John Cheever's New Yorker short story of the same name. The film stars uh, Burt Lancaster as Ned Merrill, a slow-burning tragic figure who embarks on a bizarre quest to pool hop across affluent, uh, an affluent suburban neighborhood in Connecticut. Pool by pool, he encounters old friends, flames, and rivals, which culminates into an overdose of surreal masculine panic. So, uh, Super relatable. Yeah, totally. <laughs> right off the bat, um, <laughs> this is uh, inherently spoilery, just us walking through the film, you know, um, and I'll just, side note, the reason I mainly bring that up is because when I first saw it, I had no idea uh, it was just sort of recommended to me along with other Demento titles when I was like a teenager, actually. And uh, it was just a VHS rental. And I did not know. And I took the journey just totally cold. And I was actually blown away by the last moment of the film. So yeah. really, hopefully, yeah. hopefully yeah. all you folks have seen it uh, because it really, I think, does have a great impact when you just walk into it cold. And That's I think it's fresh because it does yeah. it does have an um, impact even if you know there's like a something's coming it does color your experience of the film yeah but you're not yeah. sure what and like um, but also I mean I guess if if you don't mind I'm just kind of diving in you know uh, just referencing you know hopefully people have seen it but just one of the things I liked about it when I first saw it, and I always liked it I just rewatched it recently is um, the little clues that you're getting as a viewer that they're giving you mm. um, early on it's subtle and then it's it's compounding. You know, things like a, a look that one of the neighbors gives, you know, maybe a comment that's kind of um, like squashed by their partner. The, yeah, you know, there's it's a like, lot of nuts around, you know, yeah. Like they, <laughs> yeah. that's one of the lines that yeah. they yeah. say. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's just things like, um, you know, like hushed, like w walking someone over and uh, like from them talking to Burt Lancaster and like whispering in their ear, like, you know, you're like, what the hell is going on? And your imagination kind of uh, takes away. It's like... Um, who is this guy? Also, just uh, just to leap into the film for a second, like what always got me too about. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to just throw right into that before you continue. Is just like my yeah, own. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a very similar experience. Yeah, go for it. Um, in terms of like, I I come from a, a younger, dumber, more cynical generation than you guys. But um, mm -hmm. when I first was recommended this movie uh, from my 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 old video store days. I watched it and I'm like, you know, as soon as like you see Burt Lancaster and he's coming out of the first pool and he's like, I'm going to swim home, you know, and you're just like, 
I was just like, oh yeah. boy. And I don't even think I yeah. made it past minute 10 on the first <laughs> go around because I was like, I ain't watching. I thought this was like going to be some really? sort of. Yeah, I, I, I first time, oh, okay. and I'm young and dumb, and I'm just thinking no, okay, that this right, is, that this is going to be some sort of magical realism or proto magical realism or something like. Just I just was like, ooh, this is going to be too sentimental, too <laughs> I'm, sentimental. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. That yeah. helped. That was the perfect word. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, like, and it's, it's so a, not. It is so not. The film's, so it's a brutal punch in the face. Yeah, I know exactly. And so I, I actually was like, eh, fuck this. And then year, a couple years later, it was like really hammered home. I think when Grindhouse releasing put it out, which was kind of a head scratcher. And then they put yeah, it out, bit. and it was kind of like, okay, what's going on? And then, and then, when, of course, just like you said, when I got to that final moment, and of course, the, there's great moments from you know beginning to end mm. in this movie. Mm-hmm. But that's when I was like, holy shit, this movie is fucking Twilight Zone, and it's fucking dark. And it's really, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's really uh, it's, grim. It's funny you should say that. Yeah, no, because I thought of uh, Twilight Zone two and Willoughby. You know, I mean, it's more, um, it's a more mature work. Uh, you know, not yeah. just because it's you know three, three yeah. times as long, but it's uh, you know, uh, well, I mean, hmm, I was just going to kind of dive into the film and and, and that strange, but just that. Well, I was going to say, uh, I don't know how to start, kind of, but like, just I wanted to make a note about sort of the experiential part of the film. You know, like. Yeah, you know, there's the devastating ending, but then like, how does it start? It's like it's it really is just a guy in swim trunks, wandering out of the woods. It, it's so in, uh, immediately sort of a mythic, you know, and like uh, just pure allegory, almost like a strange fable or something like that. Like, like he has no context. I mean, the context sort of is his neighbors know him, but uh, you know, one interesting thing too about that is geographically speaking, you know, he's going down the quote unquote Lucinda River. And where we meet up with him, he's deciding to create a Lucinda River to his home, which is miles away by, like, you know, hiking between his neighbor's, you know, pools. So uh, the one thing I was thinking was like, um, that's he's well, actually, it's a mythos in a mythos. He's creating some strange mythos within this film that it's almost kind of mythically um, uh, evolving for you as the viewer. You know what I mean? It's and almost so, like Greek myth or something, right? Because he's mm-hmm, like even yeah. his manner of speech is different right. from theirs, and he, right, he refers right. to himself as noble and you know, like uh, yeah, he's got a this hero. Grecian. He looks like uh, David or something, you know, like right, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so, he's like, like a on a, like he's on a, he's on a Homeric journey, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, so that's actually all. I guess what I'm saying is just like that drew me in immediately because. Um, it's it's a normal world sort of but it's not and what i what i picked up on immediately was also that everything's really loaded you know when you have a situ- when you create a circumstance like that i'll just say for instance like him beating the little boy with the lemonade stand like mm-hmm. um <laughs> like there's this great it's it's not a pain in the ass surrealism uh and symbolism it's actually very subtly rendered you know these people are real craftspeople. you know the original short story writer and Mm -hmm. eleanor and frank like like the empty pool could have been um that could be very uh, almost like blow out or excuse me blow up blow up uh antonioni where it's like oh they're playing tennis without a ball you know and that's fine and i love it but i'm just saying like (laughs) there's this great rigor because yeah like one of the pools could be surprisingly empty but then there's this really grim significance and i think and then i'll shut up we'll move on it's just like it's a perfect example of why I love this film is empty pool. It's him and the little boy. And, and of course, Ned, Burt Lancaster, the swimmer is talking about to the little boy about like, if you make up things and make them up so good, they'll become real. And you're like, yeah, that's what you're doing right now. You fucking <laughs> yeah. maniac. Yeah, and like, but has, then the, but, yeah, but, but also, let's just say that, the, the, okay. well, just really quickly, just the icing is, um, He's, that's the advice he's leaving with that kid and walking away. And then that kid is bouncing on yes, a fucking saying. board, uh, <clears throat> imperiling himself, getting killed. And, and then he runs back and he's like, uh, uh, hold on. Like uh, that empty pool is very real. And uh, don't listen too much to this crazy old man's advice. So just all that is, so, is son, done so well, like visually, thematically. And it's just, and he, his performances are great and it looks great. The film's beautiful. So I don't know. Just for me, that's a, that's an example where you're like, if you're not hooked as a, as a, as a someone who loves film by that scene, just give it up. Hang up your hat. You know. <laughs> well, that's one all. thing I was one thing just to kind of backtrack too is like, you know, the movie is constructed around these sort of vignettes uh, from pool to pool, right? Like, you know, as yeah. Burt Lancaster is meeting. Uh, or he's going from pool to pool in this weird, you know, suburban uh, affluent neighborhood. He's meeting, you know, these different 
folks and there's different dramatic sequences that sort of play out and you were saying earlier that before we were recording that each pool kind of has like a sort of allegorical or metaphorical quality to it too like they kind of get well, I was saying it has an emotion well that too. too yeah yeah that it's like when they get to obviously at the end jumping ahead here for a second but when we get to the sure. end it's like you get the public pool which is obviously the lowest you can go on holy the- shit i know that is that so is out of a horror movie it like is. i forgot that sometimes you know the way seconds uh shot the same year by the way suburban man dread uh but like um if that becomes a horror movie scene like i hope a public pool has never gotten that grotesque yeah. because <laughs> yeah. you know the camera uh, an underwater camera is like handheld and like right on top of all these people and you know like you're seeing it burt lancaster vision in that pool so that is so horrific compared to the start of the film um which is very uh, idyllic you know what i mean it's like there's so much love of nature and and you're really lulled by the beauty of nature the trees oh, yeah. glinting yeah. you know the leaves glinting in the sunlight and all it's just incredible and then it becomes this grotesque lump of horrible human flesh <laughs> that's just like pulsating in it's barely in water you know yeah. it's a nightmare it gets, it gets worse the closer he gets to like his reality crossing the street is is horrifying yeah. you know yeah yeah yep. uh, well, let's uh yeah. let's unless marcus unless you want to throw down in that i think we should r- just go back a little bit to the beginning talk a little bit about the the backstory but if you uh if you got anything you wanted to toss into the, uh, on this pool chat we're having here Oh, pools. Yeah, no, I just thought like it was interesting how they set how they were like uh, they they when they were riding it they sat down and they thought like now what what what's every kind of pool that he could go to you know they they thought it out very well they're like oh, there's an empty pool and there's a public pool and there's a, a party uh, pool nudist pool party. you know there's a pool party there's, there's you know, a pool party yeah yeah and and in the way that it's staged like that you know for me it recalled like plays you know. And um, yeah, so if part of it feels like a filmed play to me, like the the, dra- the drama and the storytelling feel like a play in a way. But then it's got these like weird connective scenes, you know, like yeah. stitching them together. Yeah, yeah, they're very cool. Those scenes actually are kind of some of the most stylized, and all those interstitial moments of uh, some of my favorite scenes in the movie are actually the in between pool moments where it's Bert walking with, I think, uh, Julie is the character's name, the blonde-haired girl, if I remember correctly. Uh, My babysitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's all these just great impressionistic shots, which is brilliantly photographed. It's and, so beautifully filmed, and, yeah. And it's so S- Especially in the earlier part of the film, yeah. Yeah, and just like, like just, yeah, passing through the leaves, passing through the branches, and of amazing, course, like amazing. doing all the dialogue MOS, like let's not show them talking, mm-hmm. let's just do it all that way. Yeah. And that's just like brilliant. crane oh, shots and zoom lenses, and oh, yeah. hold on, I gotta say this. I made a note of this earlier. Um, it's one of my favorite things of the film is that it uh, it's a practical decision, I'm sure, but it creates it a very surreal vibe that I really love, which is. Um, you're, they shot in nature in the woods, but then occasionally, I don't know where, it's a set. You know, like I think when she, the babysitter's lying down and they're talking, that's a set. There's like, I don't know, three or four times where it's like clearly a set. And again, maybe it's practical, but it just does add to the surrealism. Yeah. Like the lighting's kind of wrong in a cool way. And like, you know, uh, so, because um, that's, that's really the heart of the film, you know, is, yeah. is you're, it's, it's even more than interstitials. It's like, again that mythos the mythology of it all where it's this you know like a barrel chested man who's barely is wearing like a loincloth is going through the woods on a journey you know what i mean with these moments of of hitting civilization and a pool and stuff like that so uh and it's filmed so beautifully and and there's, and and just the inherent weirdness let's not forget the slow motion scene with the babysitter oh, yeah. and the uh, the horse obstacle <laughs> course no the obstacle course you know like yeah yeah you know, yeah and then of course it's so there's, yeah, it's yeah. Interesting. Well, of course, there's weird. a reason why those feel different. Like, which I guess we'll get into whenever we start oh, talking yeah. about the behind the scenes. But. Yeah, let's let let let's let's also talk a little bit about just the just the source material. Let's just go back to that yeah. for a minute. So, back to basics. <clears throat> so John Cheever wrote this short story for the New Yorker, uh, which is the source material for this film. It's twelve pages, isn't that right? Isn't that what? what twelve it is? pages only. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, from my understanding, John Cheever. You know, he writes a lot about, you know, uh, suburban malaise, you know, the sort of false facade of the 50s yeah. and 60s. This is his milieu. Yeah, totally, totally. 100%, He's the totally. check off of the suburbs or something <laughs> yeah, has yeah. been said, you know, of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And uh, this story, the actual short story itself, opens with several di- different characters, maybe a majority of the characters from the short story, from the story, uh, complaining of being hung over, you know? And so right yeah, away, I read it's that. like, it's that's great. what's, yeah, that's what's kind of starting everything, kicking everything off in the story. And um, that it's like, we are in the midst of one of those depressive, you know, sort of uh, malaise of, of like a, you know, hangover after a major bender, you know? And, and that's really, mm-hmm. once we get to that first pool scene right in the beginning, as you were talking about earlier, that's one of the first things you hear from the characters is they comment on the hangover and how much they drank last night. He's drinking throughout this whole fucking movie. Um, and so that's kind of a huge part of it. A huge part of it is that sort of hangover, uh, you know, d- that sort of daytime, daymare sort of hangover. Yeah, sort of well, and, and that's a, yeah, well said. And actually just... Um, <laughs> They do make a point in the film at some point, right towards the end of the public pool, where it's clear that like uh, Nettie has been drink drinks often at the tavern because like the guy who owns the bar or whatever uh, is one of the very disappointed people and uh, people who are very um, you know um, dismissive of him. You know, he says something like, "We you'd be there four or five days a week and you never paid your bill." You know, so it's like so. I guess what I'm saying it's like Nettie was a big lush. And so we're getting into like real archetypes of the kind of World War II generation yeah. male. Uh, it does, it, yeah, that generation, yeah. it's pretty wild. Like I remember that's one thing I picked up whenever we go to the Rose Bowl to like look at old like, uh, you know, all the antiques there and stuff. Everything from the 50s, they had so many ashtrays, just like party accoutrements, like ashtrays and like sure. shakers and special glasses. And like they just, they partied, you know, oh, yeah. like – yeah, I guess. I guess that's partying. No, I know. No, totally. And you know, I have been rewatching Mad Men, and it is kind of a coincidence that we're doing this. But um, you know, it's famous that like, did human beings drink that much? If you're watching Mad Men, it's like, I'm. You know, they're they're very strict on uh, accuracy on that show, and it's like I think they drank at that volume. It's like, uh, well, I've already started. Like that's a term. And it's in the film, actually, like a term they use a lot in Mad Men is in uh, The Swimmer. It's like, uh, she's already started, you know, yeah. which means basically like uh, she's already five deep, you know, and then and now she's joining us at this party. It's like, Jesus fucking Christ. And it's yeah, just like, yeah. don't you lie down? And it's like, also, it's just like a red flag, like depression. It's like, it's not partying. It's like, especially the way yeah. Nettie was drinking. Yeah. It's just like, I, I, it's just yeah. like, kill the pain, kill the pain, you know. I remember there was a lot of that with like my, my I've been, con- been confirmed by my uh, my granddad that that was like part of the routine back then as a businessman was just to like you know drink a lot. It was kind Gay of there. drink. Like I think like, like just drinking in American culture has been a thing since like the old West times. You know, well, just, it is I think that, that like people. It's that World War Two generation. You know, I mean for sure, right? Yeah, I remember there was like some Ken Burns thing on alcohol and it was like talking about how it was German beer culture where people would just drink beers all day, but it was like really low alcohol content mixed with like English whiskey and Irish whiskey culture. So they would just drink all day, but they would drink hard alcohol all day. And that's sort of like where American Uh, drinking culture came from, you know. Wow. Also depression. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, no, no, it is. it is, yeah. It's to get us to this other main topic of the film and what we were going to discuss, but just basically uh, partying is happening, but also just having drinks alone and stuff like that, you know, and um, or well, just even like, hey, or it's like yeah. seeing an old friend like, well, what, what's the first thing we do? Like, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Poor, poor. Takes me a drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. And so I mean, what I was going to say is just like um, we're talking about the World War II generation. And this topic I'm bringing up, and I'll shut up. It's just like um, the disillusionment by the time you get to the mid '60s of they had a harrowing experience with World War II and this and the Depression, which we can't even relate to unless our future is going that way. Um, then and then you want to have a good time in life. You're getting older, and you want to actually calm down and have a nice home. And you do figure out a better life than you had with the depression and, and, and World War II. But then like 10 years later from the mid fifties to the mid sixties, you're like, this isn't working. And that was happening for millions. Mm-hmm. And that's film is the film is a reflection of that. Somewhat. Right. The facade, right. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of the try and it was crafted by, you know, Madison Avenue to that dream, right. Of like, sure. The, uh, you know, the Donna Reed lifestyle, the Ozzy and Harry, whatever that sort of like, but people wanted it because, they we wanted really some normalcy can't. from the horrors of the war, right? Like now we're going to stay well, home and, and the have, depression. Like, children, and, yeah, right. I right. don't think we can understand this. Like, and I guess what I'm saying, and 
I always mention this, but like, there's such a hard boomerang that people don't understand unless they lived it. It's like yeah. you had the depression and it was immediately followed by World War II. So it was like almost 20, it was like 15 hard years and they wanted to have something different and they wanted to take control of their lives. And they had some vague idea. You're absolutely right. Madison Avenue like filled the blank of like, what, what's a happy life look like? It looks like this, you know, like right. a new washing machine. And <laughs> then, but then by the mid sixties, it's like, what the hell is this? And it's like, drink, fuck this. Like, I'm not happy. Yeah. I don't, I'm not having a good relationship with my wife. I'm going to sleep around. I hate my kids. You know, it's just like, like, um, yeah. and, and again, I'm just saying that's what this film is a snapshot of, in my opinion, totally. a very concrete one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It feels like Frank Perry goes there a little bit too. Just like how modern society creates like a psychosis inside your brain, you know, like diary of a yeah, mad no, housewife. Right. And yep. like, um, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. yeah, play it as it lays, you know, yeah. like there is that sort I mean, of like last summer. Well, if you want, yeah. oh, I was just going to say that was, that was their next film. Total side note. I mean, I'm a huge Frank Perry slash Eleanor fan and um, like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is like one of his, their big works. And like, if you just do the math, you've got, yeah, Mad Housewife, play it as it lays. And uh, it all kind of fell apart and they wound up doing, or he did, uh, um, Mar uh, Mommy Dearest. Yeah. But like, <laughs> I'm just saying right now, formally, I would recommend to everyone who likes the show, uh, check out Frank and Eleanor Perry films. They're very rewarding. Yeah. They're very hip, especially last summer. I would do a one fucking hour on last summer. Even even oh, yeah. Mommy Dearest is still dealing with those same issues. It's true. Right? Like, it's true. You know? it's I mean, they're all, they're, all, yeah. they're all gems. They're all gems. They're all yeah. gems. Yeah, they're all yeah. gems. I mean, yeah, but gem. last summer really deserves another set of eyeballs. But uh, and, and that was, well, actually, maybe let's spend another second here as we're, you know, rattling the, the pinball around. Um, so this is weird. So it's it's, Frank and Eleanor Perry, they'd had a couple uh, hit-ish indie films in the early 60s, and they got hired to adapt the Cheever short story. And um, so she wrote the screenplay and expanded it from the 12 pages, and he, Frank, did the, the directing. But this is weird, and I didn't know this till today. Uh, this was released in 68, and it made more sense to me that it was 68. Like, it's time for the Hollywood screen to get a little more frank and a little more sour, you know, right? But this yeah. was shot in 66. Right. And then this is a it's a total Frankenstein movie. It was shot in 66. And then the this kind of asshole sounding producer, mogul guy went, "You're fucking up my movie." And he he fired the Perrys. They were out they were frozen out. And he took the film to a young director, Sidney Pollack, who was very talented. And they did really it's almost like a 60-40, you know, it's like 40% um uh, Pollack. And just to give you guys an understanding, there was a lot of reshoots and uh, there's a ton of recasting. And I think this one's very significant. Um, the the woman, the, the penultimate kind of, well, one of the last pulls the is that woman. She the meets mistress. Solo. Yes, the mistress. And that's Janice Rule. Janice Rule replaced a shot scene with Barbara Loden, who's famous uh, for her film, you know, Wanda, which is an epic and which we should do someday. Love Wanda. But uh, I was reading right. some notes because uh, Eleanor Perry has this great like write up on the uh, the hell behind the scenes of making this film and huh. and just uh, the producer didn't like barbara loden i don't know why and i'd love to see that alternate scene that's, oh that God. she's the star of but that is a sydney pollock shot scene and i think a lot of the um scenes um like they replaced like two or three other people the chauffeur so, so, was uh originally billy, billy d williams, d. williams. <laughs> yeah even the chauffeur really? they reshot that like, yeah, yeah isn't that what why did we shoot that scene that's a great scene that is ultimate cringe like that, that the the the, the chauffeur is just like, yeah. And the guy before me, uh, he had a really good rhythm, right? Let me guess. And it's just like tense, yeah. you know. Um, just a great '60s moment, you know, of uh, <laughs> you know, culture, racial clash. But like, um, yeah. So anyway, just know. And I, I don't know how I, I think, feel. I think I'm Sidney Pollack too. Like he shot all. We shot all those connective tissue scenes that we're talking about that we liked all the photography. I don't on, know like, if it's all of them. I'm a little confused. I, I, that's what I had read was that, I mean, yeah. Really? I think I needed some or something. I think huh? like that, that like sure. the, the Perry's had different transitional scenes in my, and, that, and it does make sense to I me. Mean, like intellectually that makes sense to me, you know, cause it feels so different. looks so different. You know, mm -hmm. those crane shots to the trees and stuff. And some of the like lyrical stuff where he's like sh silhouetted walking into the woods down a country that's, lane or whatever. That's more Pollock is what people are saying. That was I my understanding, but I wouldn't no. say that. 
not his oh. style i'm saying i think it's a little bit like um they didn't finish the transitions something like that but then wholesale poly I, I guess i'm just saying you're guaranteed that's a pollock scene pollock scene excuse me where it's noted that there are switch outs like the barbara loden switch out so right. i think he helped right. but um i still think there's a lot of frank perry in the film but anyway it's, it's just one of those weird things then it comes out in 1968 um and of course it was thrown into the bus by the studio because in 1968 they had no idea how to deal with this stuff you know and of course it bombed and i think just one little reference to 1968 in another film very similar we should do it someday is pretty poison uh, which, which is that. another film that's like maybe a year or two ahead of its time in, yeah. in, in finding an audience pauline kale championed it uh, majorly uh, the only person who did really pretty right. poison and there's a couple trippy idyllic nature scenes in that film if you recall yeah when perkins is, is yeah okay he sleeps in the yeah. woods mm -hmm. after the murder of the mom and sorry spoiler but like uh, anyway <laughs> it's just uh 1968 is a very strange time it's a what's that term an echo tone you know yeah. where um like there's that sour late 60s is coming up against the more formal classic filmmaking um and uh it's a great combination you know and uh anyway rambling also another side note uh backstory is um that Burt Lancaster wasn't the first choice. Did you guys read right. about that? I didn't. William no. Holden. Wow. Uh, was was definitely a, like a, the priority. That was like they're really moving forward with him. And then it became kind of rando, and it was things like Paul Newman, which is so wrong because yeah. he's too young. It's just yeah, it's so yeah. wrong. Yeah, it's so wrong. Yeah. But Burt actually read it, and I don't know where Burt's career was quite at that time. But he was a real champion, and he loved it. And I'll quote: He said, "It's." Uh, my favorite performance in my favorite film. Yeah, like he he was very and he and he paid for the last day's shoot. He put down ten thousand dollars to get the film. Yeah, uh, finished. So I like that feeling because and he did is a great job. It's like sometimes I like this thing where it's like the actor uh, actress they know it's it's like the big film of their lives and they're giving that. their all. I love and that. and the and performance is so powerful. Exactly. He does. How about I, yeah? I was just gonna like say him also, like just wallowing in the pool. You know, go ahead. Oh, no, no, you're right. I mean, he, he gives an incredibly nuanced Talk performance. To me. Again, let's for, talk about for, Bert. Yeah, for an old school sort of Hollywood guy, as you were saying, stepping into this, I mean, you know, you also can read behind the scenes stuff where this guy works his ass off. He's he's working out every day for like months to build up to this role. Mm -hmm. He's in incredible shape for, you know, whatever he is, 52, 53. 50 something, yeah. Yeah, for this. And and uh, he, yeah, he gives, he delivers an incredible performance. God, I also it's read, so good. I also read, just tacking on to what you were saying about the producers firing the Perrys, I also think that the relationship, what I heard, between Lancaster and the Perrys, or at least just Frank, was really also uh, strained. And I think that it might have played fraught. a part of it. Was. Yeah, fraught. Yeah, I think that also played a part in the Perrys probably also being dismissed from the movie. I just No, it was. I would, it I would, was. I would wager. But uh, yeah, no, he, he's... But he's I think it's going to be like, I, I, I would think, tiny comment on that, and then run with it is um it probably is one of those things where like uh, great work comes out of tension like godfather set was very tense right thoughts perhaps it's very I tense know. I, I i don't know it's like I, it, it is interesting that you know someone like bert you know from his generation i mean the movie is a kind of about a guy from that generation and you know he he must have he must have really identified with it. He must have identified with that character in a I'm major sure. major way I'm in order sure. to go that far with it. You know, in, in that time period too. It's like you don't really hear about. Maybe I'm wrong. A lot of people in 1966 sort of taking a role I've, to that extreme. I don't know. I don't know. I, no, I, out totally. It's daring. And, no, yeah. exactly. Well, and also just being. Well, how about this? Just let's articulate uh, the kind of uh, extreme. Uh, you know, like film role, it was his only wardrobe was 17 like <laughs> blue nylon swim trunks. You know, that's the, how he looks for the entire. He never puts on a sweater or anything. And um, and God, and then he gets cold. Yeah. There's nothing. There's nothing like that first chill he gets. Like oh, it's just like, but I gotta swim and wear the thing. And it's like you are fucking nuts, dude. So <laughs> I think no, he so covers he, himself up with a book at one point too. Is that naked? Is the neatest colony? Well, he's got something he's covering himself up. No, it's with. his Maybe trunks. It's his short. It's oh, his trunks. trunks. Okay. Yeah, he he was trying to kind of he was trying to kind of level with the you know be on the same level as the meeting, nudists, meeting them halfway, right. meeting yeah. them halfway. Right. <laughs> but that scene's great too. Just to now we're at the nudist scene because that's Let's really one of the one of the first, I think. Unless, correct me if I'm wrong, real sort of subtle references to this guy being, you know, a tragic sort of loser. Absolutely. Because, because uh, like, like something like this, I'm not giving him any more. 
you know, yes. as he's yeah, walking yeah, towards yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. E- exactly. Yeah. Like, and, and so, so you're watching this movie again, going back to me, probably being 20 years old, watching this movie for the first time, being like, this is going to be really sentimental, you know, and then turning mm-hmm. it off before the nudist scene, probably. Mm-hmm. It's like, but when you really start getting to that moment in the movie is when you're starting to realize that, no, this guy isn't, you know, uh, just some bored rich guy, you know, no, he is a very deeply disturbed man that is on the on the loose you know that everyone has abandoned you know <laughs> wandering and, the um, woods yeah yeah wandering yeah. alone yeah, yeah no no exactly it's not like um well he doesn't have a home you know actually can i let's just do this for a second if you if you guys don't mind um i have some theories on uh, the prequel okay i'm trying I, I just was trying to visualize it this this uh, today um right because it is, is intentionally a- kind of vague right they left right they, or, yeah. yeah so it's, there's a lot of interpretations as to like what is his deal yeah. is right yeah, yeah it makes yeah. it really fun no totally and you know what i mean though is an even more specific thing like where did he wake up that morning you know what i mean <laughs> so 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 i just have it's not a big theory it's just like a theory where he's um you know and i grew up in westchester and it's very similar to this area connecticut and it's just like i could see everything we know for a fact that everything goes to hell wife leaves kids hate him yeah uh it's probably foreclosure yeah. he definitely got fired huge debt yeah um burning all the bridges will never get work again so um in whatever industry <laughs> he was in but no but but so i think what happened what we got here in the prequel is he has to get an apartment like a studio like an Osning. Yeah. You know, by the train, like, you know, <laughs> like really humble, 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 like divorced dad. Oh, that's where Sally Draper lives, Duplex. right? And, yeah. Austin. Well, the, the Draper's had a house there. No, oh, okay. Yeah. But I, it's not very, ah, whatever. Forget what I'm saying. I'm saying by the train tracks, it's very sli- slimy and that's where the prison is and everything. Uh, Austin and everything. <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is like some kind of humble duplexy kind of whatever place, an apartment literally uh, is where he's reduced and he's like sort of able to pay the bills and then he has this thing he's he gets um it almost it almost is like the, he reaches a point that's not dissimilar to um i'm so tired lost highway mm-hmm. where he has a breakdown do you like this theory where he has a breakdown the night before and he drinks to shit and he just completely he cracks and he has a lost highway moment where he goes well good morning I guess I should go back. Uh, I gotta go home. You know what I mean? And so he just goes like, well, I'll just go back and I'll say hi to my friends. I haven't seen them in a long time. Like he completely has somehow had a mental, what is that? Fugue, like a psychotic fugue. fugue. State. It's a fugue state. Fugue right? state. Thank you. And he cracks <laughs> yeah. because he's so depressed and drinking to death in a, in a, in a studio apartment that he just goes, well, uh, and then he just goes and he, and he, and he walks or takes the train or something. And um, that's well, my me, prequel to the theory. Let me, let me, let me simplify that. And just say that uh, maybe this was Mad Men, maybe it's not. I'm conflating shows or movies, but it's like the guy who gets fired at the job and then comes back on Monday, like nothing ever happened, right? And oh, that's Seinfeld. Down... <laughs> right, but you know what I'm saying, <laughs> like no, yeah, no, of course, of course. It's it's the guy that comes back to work who's been fired, and everybody knows, and there's a screw loose, and then everyone's like, oh shit, he just sat down. And is back to work like nothing. That ever did happened. happen to Don Draper in a way, like no. But yeah. I was thinking more of like um, a pathetic character and like I, a Jack Lemon character and something. Or oh, I, I see knows. what you're saying. You know, some something. Yeah, like Days of Wine and Roses. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's like uh, you've yeah, seen I that probably... character, that trope of somebody right. who just is. But just, just like is... um, for him to get so far gone, like like there's so much that's mysterious. Like I bet he didn't talk poetically like that. You know, like, 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 it's a sign that like, you know, like, you know what they say, like, when your dreams become more and more abstract, and kind of like mythology, you're more insane. And you're and when you just have regular dreams, you're like, yeah, just a person and like, like, Oh, I got out of a car in my dream, whatever. But like, he's just completely snapped. And he's talking politically and ethically. Yeah, I thought he was sort of tapping into his like, Matt, his ad, you know, brain. Was he that man? I believe he was right. I couldn't tell. I I don't know. I I mean, I kind of feel like I've read things that imply Madison Avenue, but I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I missed that. I was trying no, to. Yeah, it's very subtle. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird because I, I, I think I read something on. I think I read something online that labeled him as like an ad man. I it was on Wikipedia or what, but but then in the movie, I couldn't recall a moment that referenced it. So yeah. Um. But yeah. Anyway, so I thought maybe he was like tapping into that. Um. 
rewatching it this time, I thought maybe he was tapping into that, like because he's painting this world of like, no, they're at home playing tennis right now, and you know, like, yeah, right, they're doing great, like everything is peachy king, and it's not just like it's not just uh, he's the fi- idyllic fifties. He's also tapping into his like you know ad brain to be like, I'm painting this like beautiful picture of happiness you know it fits yeah it fits it works yeah no, it does um, fit absolutely but also the willoughby thing you know um because he does mention there's that brutal line where he's like um uh, when i was a kid everyone was so nice to each other you know and it's that kind of willoughby <laughs> episode you know twilight zone of that just he's real. i think he's just really i don't think uh anything relating to his previous life is happening in those kind of uh you know his extorting like like it's just like um he's uh he's regressed intensely as, as, as uh, mentally you know right to to, to like fig, to like him reading kipling as a boy that kind of thing you know mm-hmm. right it's not like really clear if like his you know his deterioration like led to his his like whatever mental deterioration he had alcoholism going insane or whatever like d- did that lead to him just like wandering the woods you know and then then his life fell apart or did his life no, and house so. everything fall apart and then i'm just saying it's open to interpretation like that uh, there is yeah. multiple yeah. ways to look at it like yeah. that, you know yeah. which you know which led to the other but yeah it's just that yeah and, i think and he I, was I, just I, a I, shitty guy and an alcoholic yeah you know and because the thing is there's narcissism yeah. That's a, and he says this shit where it's like, my chest is made of gold, you know, I'm paraphrasing, you know, like, right. he's like, I'm a special man, you know, and that's well, like male is, ego stuff. Right. I is, mean, he could have is, fallen yeah. apart because they talk about his daughters, like, disrespecting him and laughing at him and stuff. And mm-hmm. so you could, you could imagine a world where, like, he had already kind of lost his marbles a little bit. And, they th- and that, that's part of the reason why his daughters were, like partying and like living recklessly is because daddy already had like it was a joke you know yeah, i think he was just a bad parent and i think that they're a, an early boomer sign of like daddy's this big macho daddy man you know like like they're chipping <laughs> away and mocking the male archetype of you know machismo and right. um you know and all that uh, the well, the archetypal well, thing that he was i think it was just uh, i think he was I, I think and i'll shut up is i think he was a boring <laughs> normal breakdown but he had a very exciting strange post or mid breakdown i think he was just a regular kind of an every man of this type i think that's what cheever was doing where it's like and even the ad lines for the poster in the movie it's just like do you see you know yourself in him you know no you're right. like i think he had a normal breakdown but he yeah. got very strange and fantastical like yeah. mentally Ill people do sometimes i, thought, I right. saw that i noticed that in the poster too when you talk about the swimmer will you talk about yourself yeah and yeah i didn't really it's funny because i don't identify with this any of this stuff really at all you know what i mean like his life wait, his, you didn't own it wait, part you, you yeah. didn't own a hot dog cart at one point because i thought you did well, <laughs> you get my wagon it, it yeah. definitely does color like my the like in the 20s man yeah <laughs> i know you know what i it is weird. It's like project. It's like it's like really hard. A lot of movies that I like, I project myself into those situations, and I just find it like impossible with with this one. You know, well, different yeah. kind of person. Yeah, totally. And I, I just to throw down what you were saying earlier, Tom. It's just like I, I think a hundred percent. This movie is just about the the male, the masculine panic of you know uh, of trying to you know keep up appearances and su- suppressing yeah. all of that inner fucking trauma of being someone and in failure the generation and failure and all that stuff. I mean, that, that is 100% what it is. One thing I wanted to say, too, real quick, is just the idea of, you know, John Cheever, from what I understand, also was a pretty uh, insanely debili- debilitated alcoholic himself, which oh, yeah. uh, he's perfectly Shocker. depicted in the film. Uh, he has a little cameo as the lone drunk guy f- floating in the pool on, like, one of those floaties. I'll cut to the scene of it. I and saw then, that. Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah You know, yeah. Eleanor, Eleanor Perry's at that same pool, I think, too. There are two cameos. Oh, Oh wow! Wow! Is that yeah. the big pull? The big pull party? I think so. Yeah, it's just yeah, r- which r- is r- really r- raucous. Like uh, there's a guy that. standing on top of the building yeah. who like falls off of it, and like yeah, yeah, all yeah. the wild dancing and stuff. Yeah, and, really and, fucking drunk. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they started early. Yeah, right. But it's only like two. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I was just gonna say like one thing on top of this culture, right? Because the culture I think is depicted very spot on in this in terms of that region and everything i was watching it with mm-hmm. Ramy, you know one fucking hour uh, uh Ramey one fucking hour Ramy. one fucking hour Ramey. yeah they- <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh from last week's episode right um yeah. she uh 
uh, she was sort of telling me about a little bit about that Connecticut history there and that the oh. 50s, the 50s and 60s, I guess, I don't know where she knows this from, but she was saying me that she was telling me that there, there was a lot of like, like swinger couples in that time, you know, a lot of key parties. You know what I'm talking well, about? You know, the ice storm is set in Connecticut exactly. too. Exactly. You know, right? I mean, exactly. So like very incestuous, very boozy, very complicated. Everyone's mm. sleeping with everyone, everyone mm. and everyone's intermingling. And I think that if we probably pulled apart all of the different pool scenes, we'd probably find a lot of subtlety that speaks more to that. Like everyone is probably fucking everyone in this movie. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Well, actually, well, here, well, here's a good example. It's like uh, he had been sleeping with the character Janice Rule when they had that big scene together, but there's that other scene where um, uh, this woman in- informs Nettie that uh, oh, she's no longer with Hank or whatever, and she's like eh, dinner tonight, and she's like hubba hubbing with him. You know, and it's just like, uh, yeah, it's fucking suburban Babylon. It seems like, right? You know what I mean? And, he's and you see for that anybody? He's like with a babysitter, Joan Rivers. You know, he's like he's hitting on everybody. He is well because he's an like, iron god. But no, getting back <laughs> to Mad Men, it's actually um, it reminds me of Pete. Actually, if, ever, if any fans are out there, but I'm watching this period where uh, Pete is fucking all through because they moved to the suburbs. Him and his wife, and um, yeah, he's just he's just like. Who am I fucking next? Not predatory, yeah. but just yeah. like it's a given. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, well, and then I'm gonna sleep with someone new. Like, maybe it's her. It's just like a given. It's part of the the deal. Well, what you, were say, what you were saying about that scene with the mistress, right? The the one you were just talking about. That's very obviously a key key moment in the movie because that's when it really it kinda, is. goes into the third act. I think right after that, and that and and in that scene. That's when all the illusions are shattered because it's, yeah. it's you know he's not a fucking stud you know she rejects him outright and he's he's totally um, that's where everything turns that's when he starts to get that little yeah. chill and everything and he's more and more pathetic and 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 for me you not, loved it he's I screaming say, that's you what I'm saying. he's just <laughs> you loved it that's a that's a great <laughs> moment. Great moment in that. That's some good Burt stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So I, I think it's, it's up there with um my daughters love me. Yeah, exactly. Or my wagon. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, my hot dog wagon. <laughs> I'll pay twice dog, what it costs. Hot... Yeah, I know. Yeah. That, that's very mythology too, like um, you know, like some kind of chariot thing that has a significance of his um of his uh of his significance like i made a thing i made that with my i painted that myself you yeah know, it's i know like, that's so funny it, like it's it's, it's, it's totemic a- it's this totemic thing for him which but is so strange because it's the stupid hot dog wagon that's what i was gonna say but it's so <laughs> that's brilliant uh just you it know, again, is brilliant subtlety and and exposition of like for, it's so perfectly written because it's like to to want that hot dog wagon yeah. again is insane right that yeah. that's the thing that you know pulls it's, you in. It's uh, it relates to um, rosebud sled in, in a sense, you know, to it's like a, oh, like yeah. applying a lot of emotional significance to these yeah. weird objects. Well, it's like a symbolic connection that he had with his family. You know, he's, he remembers pulling his daughters around in that but wagon. It's so it's kind of but, but 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 the, but the same thing is he made it. It's like he like he mended it. He painted it himself. He wrote hot dog <laughs> in paint. But, but I want that but, thing, by the way. But I know me too. But right. it's actually I the perfect one. it's the perfect choice because it's yep. it's the perfect little prop for anybody around you to be like, Oh, that guy's fucking crazy because he wants his fucking That's, hot dog cart back. Yeah. You know, That's so interesting that you were absolutely No, the guy bulks, like, he's like, Are you kidding me? This piece of junk? Hundred dollars? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which was like, you know, fifteen hundred dollars back then. Right, right. It's you are know, talking about Homer, like how this is like Homeric journey. It just reminds me that in the Odyssey, like he carved his own bed. You know, he's he's trying to get his bed his bed has been like taken away from him by whoever's usurped him in his house. And like that's right. his one thing, he's like trying to get this bed back that he's oh, carved there you out go. of his tree. So yeah. It's that seems like a direct reference by uh but in our film let's Perry. have it be a hot dog stand a hot dog <laughs> wagon hot fresh yeah. wieners yeah. Yeah. anyway it's a great scene and anyway they love hot dogs i interrupted <laughs> but like, like you know like uh, there's some really killer exclamations that he makes yeah you know um and you loved it you were saying loved that it. with the mistress um you that's a brutal scene like actually when i was younger when i, I first saw it i thought God, I'm kind of loving this film and I wouldn't have expected to. Maybe kind of like what you were saying, Evan. That's what I'm saying. Um, I was like, this is actually really cool in a different way, you know, than I yeah. was used to. 
But I found that scene sagged a little bit for me because, um, I mean, I'm older now and it, I was getting through it better, but like it does uh, change the Which pace one? because the, uh, the the big scene with the mistress, the you loved it, you know, this meeting Janice Rule. But um, I just wonder maybe like it, it like there, it felt so different to me always when I've seen it in the past and to know now that it's actually uh, a very pivotal scene by it's a, a di- completely scene. different director that kind of, I don't know, it kind of, it didn't, the pacing's a little weird. It's uh, I think it goes on a little long and it mm-hmm. kind of, uh, there's, there is a clear pacing of that film. There's, right. the, you know, you're going from pool to pool and it kind of um, really just stops the wagon there for a long time. Yeah. And uh, it is good and rewarding, and it is important because, like you said, it is very pivotal when you get into the third act because he really starts cracking. Because I got to say, it ends with that incredible moment of wordless acting by Bert, where he's in the pool and he's like mostly submerged and he's just staring blankly at the water. You know, you remember that? It's like a close up of him. He's yeah. so lost because it's again like um, you know, it's like the cracking starting to happen in. Um, you know, uh, Lost Highway, where it's just like none of this, you know, like uh, paper mache over all my problems worked. Like I, I was getting there for a minute with the girl, the blonde girl, like that was kind of working. Yeah, I was young yeah, again yeah. or whatever. But like that didn't even work out. But he's like, it's OK, Lucinda River. But she really cracked him because um, they got into some real shit and they obviously had a very heavy relationship. You know, that for him and for her wasn't that was a significant relationship and i think that what's implied there is that that's a moment where it's like they were so close and i think they really really were into each other that um i think it could have been like i'm getting divorced i'm going to go with you and he didn't do it he choked and he just you know what i mean like like it wasn't just a fling for him or her and uh, that's what makes it so brutal and that's what actually allows the escaping uh through the cracks of you know uh fantasy because it was so significant for him and it stings so much not just that she was insulting because she was insulting him at the end um to hurt him because he hurt her so much yeah it wasn't like incredibly hurt by yeah 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 yeah, it wasn't a failure you know it wasn't just like you can't get it up in bed it wasn't that kind of thing right like uh because it follows her um uh dealing with it's a great performance of uh seeing him trudging up a lot a lot a lot of bad memories and feelings in her you know and she slams that door that has almost like an exaggerated sound effect. Oh, it does. It you caught does. that? Yeah. yeah. And I did, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's I, really every episode. Really, I know, it's true. But that that is really it. when the, that's really when the movie um yeah. you know, starts to really I think the next scene is the, surreal crossing stuff. the street. Yeah. And can we just throw do a shout out for crossing the street montage? The zooms the zooms the incredible editing you know I like know. Oh, and, pulling it's, and then him, pulling out with the car yeah. and then there's like a teenager with like a banana peel at him yeah. it's like Ugh, and he's like and he's cold and cowering and he looks fucking crazy yeah like like you see this now in the cities where like there's a guy who's barely clothed he's like oh, what's going on you know and he's just so completely gone and i remember when i first saw it that's when i went i love this film I agree. and then it's followed by the by the public pool crowding um but i was like because it hits so hard because you have a scene hit so hard like that because you've had all those beautiful idyllic beautifully shot scenes that we were talking about all those yeah. transitions between the pools and, and 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 you're lulled into his fantasy almost like yeah squirrels and the sunshine and it is so beautiful and it's like oh i love this and my it's perfect like body yeah, my perfect body. And yeah, I, and, and then it's just like teenager throws a banana peel at you as they, <laughs> you know, almost hit you, and he's like shivering, like, Ugh! and it's so brutal. And then, of course, followed by an unforgettable moment that really stayed with me. In my we'll get to that rewatching of uh, yeah. the pool, the public yeah. pool. Let's get to yeah. it now. Let's do pub- yeah. let's public pool it. Yeah, I was just like say- uh, show me show me between your toes. Yeah, <laughs> I was just gonna say um, the the uh, crossing the road scene absolutely amazing. Like you were saying, the editing uh, is really on fire there, and it, it really is that moment when you were saying like you lock in with this movie and you're like, holy shit! Like th- this is where we're going now. We're going, and it's about to get dark as shit. And <clears throat> yeah, and that that public pool scene, man. Like I was saying earlier, it's that you can't for some guy for somebody who probably came from the life that he came from wh- wherever he came from and wherever his status symbol is i can't imagine what it would be like for someone like that of that class structure to be he would never be caught dead there dead there and so it's really never be kind caught of dead like there. 
So that that also really just works super well. That's true. The movie. It is yeah. compounding. It's not like like right. there's a little bit of class in the film that's referenced. You know what I mean? Like uh, oh, his descent. Is. His yeah. descent includes going to a lower class. Even even um, uh, the bang. What is it? The bang wieners, whatever. The like they're a little. The bizwangers are lower class than um, the nudists. Are pretty much the top, they're right? Top. And then the yeah. bizwangers are kind of like the guy owns like um, uh, a chain of air conditioning businesses or something. They're, they're not like, even uh, on my Christmas card list. Yeah. Exactly. That's what he says. But then it gets even lower class with the people who ran the tavern that he overdrank, you know, it down because it was like they're like they're, they're downtown. All those people are bum money for work downtown. Like bum fifty cents for them to get into the pool. Yeah. Two but that's how he knows the families that he's meeting up with there, right? There's two couples that he yeah, kind of owes right. something to, right? Yeah, because they both because he frequented their downtown businesses. Like they're, you know, um middle class people. You know, so like uh you know, so so there's a descent there. So there's some kind of interesting thing. I don't know if we need to elaborate, but just like there's this thing of like the idyllic world that you can live in at that high stratosphere if you're rich enough you know what i mean like there's there's that can happen for you like yeah. like that, really the nudists are insane like they make it very clear the rolls royce yeah and by the way i think i looked it up that rolls royce now would be like priceless you know yeah. like oh, yeah. and they're just the grounds you know and um and uh he wasn't even up there because he actually it's funny their house is not that far from the public pool so he's doing good but he he does got climb up the pool. hill to get to his house i noticed and it has those nice uh tennis courts and stuff and it's, it's nice, nice but i'm just saying it's not the nudist you know it's like right like they're just there's references to the the stress uh, status you know right, it's interesting right. it's an interesting dynamic yeah that's, uh, that's with everything else let's <coughs> let's 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 quickly touch on that final scene because great you film because th- then the movie just fucking goes full on mario bava you know for the uh I know. For the last, uh, I know. The last, uh, well, that's a set. Like that's a set. <laughs> yeah. Like the 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 um the grounds of the house is a set, so it does take on this kind of like Hercules in the haunted world it kind of look. Does. <laughs> it does. It totally. Does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good call, yeah. young Baba. Yeah. I, and I love that. I relish. And then his posturing, even at the door as he's pounding. It very. And weird. I think they even it's exaggerate weird. the pounding sound, you know. But the way he's postured is almost like um, a sculpture of Greek mythology, you know, like, like, yeah. like you know, it's but so brilliant. Out, and shout out to brilliant fucking choice because it's a it's a callback to talking about obviously the family playing tennis and it's just the ghost people playing tennis. Yeah. And that echoey, just, um, yeah, echoey chatter, oh. and it's like, yeah, and of course it has to torrentially rain, yeah, and <laughs> yeah, and that happens. You know, there'd be uh, sunbursts. I remember that very clearly. I mean, all over the place, but I remember in New York in the summer, it would just be, oh, it's so nice, and it's just like, you know, like that happens. But it's a um, nightmare. So and, it uh, too. no, no, it, right, and so right, right. In well, Baba world, water is a big part of the movie, right? You know, it's it right. It's true. And and the, it's pouring but, all over. You no, know, but the leaves and the decay and the broken window. Actually, you know, I kept thinking of it's a wonderful life too today when I was mm. watching it. And uh, there's just some minor parallels. He's almost like a shitty Jimmy Stewart, and it's a wonderful life. One hundred percent. You know. Yeah. You guys well, know, you know what I'm saying? You, well, no, well, Burt right. Lancaster called. We forgot to touch on this. He calls the movie "Death of a Salesman" in in swim trunks. Is what he calls the movie. Yeah, I love that. You know? That's so a great tag kind of a little parallel. But no, on, but 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 it's a wonderful life. Um, like uh, there's what I mean is like when he's young, when when uh, Stuart's young in the film, he's doing the thing like, "What do you want? Uh, whatever, girl. It's like uh, I'll lasso the moon down for you. You know that kind of thing." And he's talking to that girl. He's like, "Let's go out. Let's take off her shoes and walk up in the falls." You know, and then she's like, "You're crazy." I don't know if you remember all these scenes in "It's a Wonderful Life," but he talks fancifully when he's like 20, 25 in the film, and um, it, it it's cute there. And Jimmy's. It, it works, you know, and it's charming and whimsical, but like, it's so gross and sour from this 55 year old man when he's like, let's you and me escape yeah. and we go up and live, you know, and it's just, it's, and, and, and also he's kind of a dick and like, um, he's, uh, he's just like, um, it's just this, this, this negative parallel to like, it's a wonderful life. And also it's a wonderful life. Well, he's also you a know, maniac, like on the run, like he's a home, he's like a, you know, He's yeah. basically a man without a home running around rave, renting and raving, diving in people's Yeah, pools. let's play with that theory, just circling back maybe to like the prequel thing, because I really, really love thinking that way. Let's go with, forget the Austin studio apartment. How about he subsists 
by stealing from uh, people's garages all throughout Westchester yeah. and, and Connecticut, yeah. Greenwich County. You well, know that's what I mean? What I was saying earlier, we don't know how long he's been just walking around out there. You know, is it really just one day or is this just like, Incredible. is this just like he does this all the time? You know, Incred- that's all he around. does. Like, yeah. he like, he steals, you know, there's freezers in um, a lot of times, you know, with like cold cuts and stuff and, and, um, <laughs> He you know, lives in, in the in, woods, in garages, <laughs> yeah. and he lives in the woods because it's the summer. Yeah. And it's like, let's just—I like thinking that way. That's incredible. He and showers he decides, in people's like, pools, you know, and that's what sure. It is. Yeah, no, God, totally. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> and he and he is. That's why he doesn't even have a dime in his well, fucking loose let's, nylon swim trunks. Let's let's quickly put a bow on this. I just want to say the the ending Please, is so is so amazing. That I know we are, and the the, the ending let's is so it. amazing. In terms of uh, like it, it did evoke Twilight Zone to me. Uh, the ending in, in just the fact that yeah, you know, go, you know, yeah. What were you gonna say? Oh, was, just like just the tw- I was got me a lot thinking a lot about like the development of the twist ending. You know, like it's very New Yorker. Uh, you know, a uh, uh, short story. You know, yeah. like the lottery or like yeah, this one obviously. And then um, yeah, Twilight Zone obviously is always a twist ending. Right and uh, uh, Planet of the Apes the twist ending and I was just sort of I don't know the history of the twist ending but I do know that like sometimes you go back and read something like uh, Wuthering Heights and you're surprised that there's not a twist you know like it's it's not a twist ending like so it I just, seems like some it's, point it seems like it's leading to that kind of literary move yeah right, right right so it's just interesting I wonder about like the development of that and when it became a staple of it's like so film, funny you, you know? say that because when we uh, Ramy and I were just watching it and her immediate reaction i mean she's seen it before obviously but watching it again she was like planet of the apes planet of the apes the ending it's very planet of the apes the ending it is is. well even a lot of his exclamations like my daughters worship me (laughs) is not unlike pounding the mud like they blew it up and he's and guess who's also shirtless yeah. yeah, right. right. Well, he's Charlton got that Heston. acting style that is Charlton Heston, like Ben Hur, kind of like. It's a, uh, I call, I call it an acting, yeah. acting, uh, acting with your chest, like barrel-chested male <laughs> acting. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Chest I love acting. it. Chest acting, uh, yeah, acting I guess with your you, chest. I guess if you guys, if you guys will humor me here, just while we have five minutes left, please, yeah, five, which I can't it's, even believe. It's such a great film. Um. I, I just wanted to quickly touch on all the gimmicks that are in this film, uh, all the all the amazing technical stuff you're seeing in this movie. Just real quick, you know, there's there's Let's so many great split diopter, there's telephoto lens mm-hmm. shots, there's mm-hmm. filters up the yin yang, crane shots as you mentioned, slow motion, double exposure. There's also like really cool. Uh, I think it's one of the first shots in the beginning of the movie where it seems like it's not even a crane. It seems like the camera's actually being pulled on a rope like up mm. you know when you first when you when we first kind of see him go through the first pool something yeah. like you'd see I out think, of like i'm asking it was shot, shot through a mirror maybe even you know what i mean like in that opening stuff because it's very wobbly you know and i was wondering oh, if yeah. there a mirror like up and like that's oh, why it has like a little bit of shake to it you know and yeah, the, the, the the telephoto thing was something that got me thinking that maybe it was sydney pollock that did the those shots later because i think that's like a later 60s thing is to like get into telephoto stuff and like Right. Other Frank Perry stuff that I've seen is like has that more close TV style, like kind of like blocking of the actors. So, yeah. well, last know. summer gets last summer does get kind of lyrical though, mm. uh, in, in a it's similar true. way. It's true, you know. And who knows? With, with maybe nature, it's a, maybe it's a killer cinematographer it, too. You don't know. We don't know. Oh, I think you know what? That's a good point. I think the cinematographer is consistent, but I'm not sure. But th- yeah. that's a good point. You know. It might be he took a, a a big lead on that, and he was given a lot of rope by both yeah. of them to just go ham on it, you know, um, cause whoever did it, it's, uh, it's just, it's a great looking film. It's true. You know, Oh, but, uh, you're killing me with the Mario Bava though. You know, <laughs> the, it the is ending. Mario Bava. It is Mario Bava ending, but it has <laughs> literal killer tech, uh, killer technicolor movie. Like seriously, some of the best. It, yes. Uh, yeah, it does. See. It's a beautiful film. So I guess some of the bullet points are, there's so much powerful shit going on here. Uh, big ups to Bert's, uh, performance. I could see it, being a lesser film if it wasn't handled as well as he did because he's the film you know Bert's the film and the film's Bert and uh, he really does nail it and I think that he did probably relate to the character and he probably is just you know reiterate what we were saying and um I think that really comes through and uh I love hearing like I said when an actor and actress really um uh cares about and and because it's so rare in Hollywood you know, like when they really have a personal investment in the performance and you can tell that he really cared. Uh, 
that Tom, makes a I huge got, difference. Tom, I have yeah. to jam. I, I I have to jam your fucking head for a minute. The cinematographer oh. of the swimmer also <laughs> shot Pretty Poison. Cracking up. Oh, poison. oh, he did. Yeah. Case closed, motherfucker. <laughs> Case closed. Because no, because if you guys go, we should do Pretty Poison. By the way, as a '60s film, but uh, it's almost the same photography. Uh, like I said, it's when um, it's just when Anthony Perkins sleeps in the woods one night. God damn, dude. And Tuesday Weld yeah. is in another is uh, is in Pretty Poison and also in Played as It Lays. That's right. That's right. And so is Perkins. Yeah. Right. So, Perkins. so uh, yeah. So we just have a few more minutes here. It's just uh, this went real fast. I'm just a big <laughs> fan. Um, I'm just looking at my dumb notes. Uh, I think we're good. I just, you know, I just got to shout out my wagon. That's my fucking wagon. <laughs> it's my hot dog wagon. You know? Yeah, it, it really is. It re- That really That's is. That's all I got to say. The most underrated scene of that film is the idea. I completely of- forgot it. I was blown I like, away by it. A sidebar. I like when she's talking about how she st- she's doing computer dating. Oh, I was going to say that. That's, it's the yeah. first mention yeah, of that's online great. dating. It's the origin. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> it's, like, it's just silly. All the kids are doing it. Oh, no, no. Big shout out. Joan, Joan Rivers, Rivers is in it. First film performance. And I actually, you probably all read this today. We were researching was like, it's her first film, basically. And it took like a t- days to shoot her Seven exchange days. with Bert. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about that. I, I doubt what that. I, read. Just, <laughs> I think the whole I'm just, I'm sure it's an exaggeration. Cool. But it took a long time. Yeah, right. But I guess um, she was saying that she was being pulled from Bert and and frank and they had different um wow. approaches to the scene and the interaction and i guess it's it sounds like another thing uh, where it's a special film because bert is actually involved in the direction you can hear that from what the anecdote joan sang I, so that's another kind of special care there's like two yeah. people who really there's nothing like a hollywood film where a bunch of people give a fuck that's, that's one of those films yeah it's not like you know Marlon Brando on like uh, fucking uh, yeah. what's that Dr. Freshman? Moreau yeah, <laughs> yeah you know it's 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 it's, it's no, I know. we should do that uh, it's more it's more just you know the idea that everyone cares so much to make this yeah special. and that's yeah. that's the thing I think we're I think we wind up doing if we look back a lot of films where everybody cares <laughs> okay next movie let's go okay <laughs> all right yeah, but we can't recommend the swimmer enough it's very rewarding yeah, David Schwimmer. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. That was uh, one fucking hour on The Swimmer. Um, yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, I hope you all seen it by the time uh, uh, before watching this uh, one fucking hour, but definitely go back That's and rewatch recommended, it. recommended, yeah. Yeah, well, go back and rewatch it if you haven't seen it in a while. Is it it's, uh, it's on like Prime or something? I, yeah, just, I just watched it on Prime. I actually also own the disc, Perfect. which which allegedly has a two and a half hour or something uh, making up yeah. doc, which I haven't actually watched yet. So I, should, I gotta I watch watched that. that before. I know <laughs> I don't have it. He is the Blu-ray, I but uh, I couldn't get it. It's in. Longer, than it in. longer than the film. Longer than the movie. I am going to watch that. So, I do like when the, that Grindhouse put it. I like when me too. something an oh, oddball film gets released by somebody other than Criterion. and I'm always like applauding. Yeah, exactly. I know. Okay, good. Somebody else got hold of it. Like, and just. they had the good taste. Like, yes, the I drink your blood guys. Yeah, had good taste that you guys yeah. slept on. You know, it's it, the fucking yeah. swimmer. Yo. Exactly. My fucking wagon. I, I, I love that. Um, I wanted to also uh, apologize for last week. Uh, I got I got real busy in uh, Atlanta with really bad internet, so we had to skip. Well, a week. we all did some fentanyl, so you know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, but we're I'm back. Sorry. I'm gonna... We're back, <laughs> and we, we're back to the normal schedule now for for a little bit, hopefully. But uh, for now, we, for now. Uh, but uh, le- that's a good segue into next week, which is a very important next week because guess what, guys. <laughs> It's our second birthday boy episode. Birthday boy episode, and it's m- 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 Marcus. Birthday <laughs> yep, time. Yeah, dude. Birthday, birthday boy. Birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, dun, 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 dun. Your, your, your birthday is actually in a couple of days, but so it'll be a, l- a couple of days past uh, by the time we record, but who cares? But it's that time. It's that week. It's the, the birthday week. You know. I know. I know. So obviously. it's sallow, right? <laughs> yeah, Phil Pasolini, my I Pasolini birthday party. <laughs> oh my God! Now I like his be, I like his style. Be careful what Tom <laughs> says and throws out because it's gonna you know you never know what might stick like mask. Uh, but anyway, uh, it did happen, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but your your birthday pick, Marcus. Now this we went back and forth a lot on, but I want you to hit it hit it with us. Hit hit us with it. 
It's going to be, this is a sort of embarrassing, but it's going to be my Star Wars birthday party. <laughs> Yay! Can I be Obi-Wan? Yeah. Oh no, I'm Obi-Wan. Can I be, can I be, uh, no, I'll be Baba? young Obi-Wan. Yeah. Can I be pun Oh, God. <laughs> um, he's he's already dropping the, uh, I don't even know what that the is. Nerd, the nerd names. It's uh, Walrus Man, you know. Yeah, it is. Oh, I love Walrus Man. Yeah. But, um, all right. We are. Uh, this will be interesting. I think actually. At yeah. First, all kidding at, aside. At first thought, it's like you know, you no know way. Um, but then I think the more I've been thinking about it, the more I'm excited for it as a challenge because I don't think us three are going to approach this as like a, a a critique of the phenomenon, a critique of culture, Star Wars culture, or fan bullshit. No, we're going to take all the fan out of Star Wars. And we're going to look actually at the film itself as a standalone movie and also look at really some amazing, uh, stop me if this sounds wrong, but human kind of element to the making of the movie. Like really grounding uh, how Star Wars came together. Let's let's throw out yeah. all this other bullshit and really talk about um, this as a movie. Hell, I love Star Wars when I was a kid too, but I'm also fascinated by a lot of the details that went into making this movie that people don't really talk about anymore. Like they don't even... They don't even think about it anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really a triumph of, like, revision. I always looked at so the original Star Wars being a triumph of revision and that we don't always have that luxury in this day and age to go back and, like, right. rewrite the work, change it, you know? And it went through so many – if it was the first – if the first script he wrote, you know, uh, was what they shot, it would be a lot different. And there's just so many things that – so many factors which caused him to go back and revise the film, not just the film, but even – Revised his own narrative of how he of how it all came together. Right. Um, that kind of led into the whole package today. But yeah, I always think about it that way, and it'll be fun to kind of dive into that and see like all the different um... and the ephemera. I feel like we're going to get into some of the weird, obscuro ephemera of Star Wars. We're going to touch on some of the <laughs> underrated players involved in the in the in the film. And um, mm -hmm. right, I mean, right. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. <laughs> My, well. Me personally, I mean, it's birthday boy's choice, of course, but what interests me in this pick is, um, A, I like the idea that, that the three of us can just do any movie. Like, right. let's just talk about any movie. It doesn't, doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. And, and this is an example of that because it's, uh, you know, we did Sledgehammer once and now we're doing Star Wars. But what I mean is, you know, I saw it when it came out around that time. And for me, like, it was just a film. It was a movie. It had no uh, before you know, there was a time, I mean, I guess that's partly an age thing. Like I saw it when I was a little kid when it came out. So I didn't have any context for it, which is, I never even thought of that. But like, I guess people who are younger. It's just like has all the shitty weight all over it already. Like there's for young people. It's like, yeah, I know the Ewoks real good. And I saw, and then I saw New Hope. You know what I mean? But I just right. saw a movie called Star Wars. And for me, I had recently seen um, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. And I was, that's what I was doing. I was a little kid. And I was mentally comparing like, that's better than Sinbad in the Eye of the Tiger, you know? Yeah. But it made me think of it. It made me think of Tiger when I first was watching Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And so um, I kind of want to get back to not the nostalgia of like when I first saw it as a kid. I just mean like there was a time when it was new for everyone. And, um, and specifically, it was just a movie. Hey, what's playing this week? What's playing next week? Next week is this movie Star Wars. And then yeah. after it's Sorcerer. You know, it's like it's a movie that played in a theater – and there is a way to look at that. And I'd like to do that even just for a little while, the podcast, um, without the weight, the heaviness, which depresses and bores me to oh, no end. Horrible. But not the film. Film's great. Film when, I, great. when I fell in love with the film, it was very fast. It was um, when those two robots were in the desert. I went, oh, shit, this is good. Because we're already somewhere else. You know what I mean? Because it's like, and just to say, for example, like where my head would be at, it's like we're in outer space and I thought, oh, maybe we're going to be there the whole time in ships. <laughs> like now we're in the desert and there's the skeleton of the huge dinosaurish thing. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. You know, like all the, no, no really. I remember yeah, that. No, I went I know, like, I know, oh, this is different. This is different. This shit's alive. And, and, and again, no one's phoning it in, you know? Yeah. All right. Like Lucas gave a fuck about that movie. So... <laughs> Mar We're going to do Star Wars. Guys, Marcus's big birthday Star Wars spectacular <laughs> will be 
<laughs> next week, uh, I I got to get you like they a, made me pick it. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we did. We, we kind of did. Uh, yeah, uh, but you know, hey, I think it makes sense. It's your birthday. Star Wars and birthdays go very well together. And this is a very it's true. One fucking one fucking hour on. Well, here. Uh, <laughs> May the force be with you guys. I'm a huge star. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Stupid joke so, alert. So one fucking hour on Star Wars, everybody, uh, is next week. And uh, yeah. Uh, I had Get your pre-watch fun. in if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Right? Well, I, I, I tra- won't. <laughs> hey, if you can track down the fucking... Watch it. If you can track down the original fucking version of the movie, then good. I know, good. right? Like um, try to find the pre-90s um, yeah. one. Yeah. Which is sure. always a good thing. No, mm-hmm. definitely. It's out there, but it not is out officially, there. I guess. Not officially, but it's out there. All right, everybody. Well, this was great. One fucking hour on the Schwarmer. Great. And uh, Star Wars next week. Uh, then we'll get back to some uh, normal one fucking hour shit. You know, so. oh, we got we to watch the Super 8 version of it, right? Isn't that, Tom, Tom, isn't that what we do? We watch the Super 8 version of Star Wars? Uh, I've, I've dusted that off. It's a very cool <laughs> watch. And it actually Whoa. has, um, what's his name? Greedo fires first, shoots first. Greed, Greedo. What's his name? Of course. Yeah, yeah. You say Fredo? Yeah. Fredo? Fredo? I'm smart. Fredo? Yeah. Fredo I'm smart. Yeah. yeah, Fredo shoots first. Um, <laughs> Fredo. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I want a shirt that says Fredo shot first. Like, you know, as a, as a pro We'd have to make that. That's our one and only one fucking hour shirt. Fredo shot first. <laughs> I knew it was you. <laughs> That's oh, the worst that's thing so ever. Stupid. Oh, right. you greedo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. But, uh, but of course, you can't let you go without your moment of zen. So uh, take it away. All right. See you guys later. And good night. The Swimmer. A story that goes beneath the surface. Stars Burt Lancaster. I'm a very special human being. When you talk about The Swimmer, will you talk about yourself? The Swimmer, in Technicolor. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. (laughs) 